hello and thank you for choosing to come back to my channel if you're new here my name's Lisa I cover true crime cases um, usually once a week um, so I very much appreciate you being here um, I'd love for you to give us a like a little subscribe I'm trying to grow my channel it's very small at the moment but um, we're trying to get there we're trying to cover some cases that maybe haven't been covered as much before if possible and um, today we actually have a true story of a real Friday the 13th killer we all know the movie um, but this guy is an even bigger monster than Jason Voorhees. So just before I start with my video today, um, just to say all the information I have found, I have garnered from watching different documentaries, reading different articles. If there is inaccuracies there or you know more up-to-date information, obviously feel free to pop it in the comments. Um, I really appreciate that. Um, obviously be polite, be nice. Um, we do get so many people correcting us on all manner of things and, and sometimes politeness doesn't cost very much. And as for my accent, apologies if there is difficulty with that. I know I have some viewers in the US and someone has expressed that they need to watch my videos with closed captions as my accent is too British. I'm Irish incidentally. Um, so hopefully I will try and speak as plainly as possible and hopefully you can understand me. Um, without further ado, let's get into the case of David McCready and Friday the 13th murders. So Friday the 13th of April 1973 would be a day that would change the lives immeasurably for a number of people. Parents would be without children and a young man called David McCready would be looking forward to spending a vast portion of his life in prison. The best way really for me to tell the story as the actual night in question itself is it's not something that David has ever spoken quite openly about. So to give you a bit of background, I'm going to tell you a bit about David, what led up to it, how he ended up living with his friends, and just to give you an idea um, where we're coming from. So in 1951 in Southport in England, David McCready was born to parents Bella and Thomas McCready. Bella had five other children. David was the second oldest sibling and her husband Thomas worked in the Royal Signals in the army so he was away from home a lot. The family also moved a lot all around the UK. They spent time in Germany especially which was when the family say they were happiest. Um, very normal family. They enjoyed biking, picnicking, skiing obviously when the weather allowed. Um, so there's nothing really major that stands out in the history of David McCready as a child. There is one isolated incident when the family were actually living in Cardiff where David stole his mother's housekeeping money, her shopping money, to trick a trip to Liverpool. Now this was completely out of character, it wasn't something David would normally do, um, but it was the first sign of the impulsivity that David may become subject to a lot later in his life. So moving on to 1967, David leaves school at the age of 15 and he enrolls in the Royal Navy. Now this has been a lifetime dream for David. He's always wanted to be in the Navy. His father was not that supportive, which was surprising when I read the history with his father being a military man himself, but he must have been a man of very high standards as he didn't feel David was cut out for the Navy. And he, did, he made no secret of this. He told David he thought he was making a mistake, but given how much David wanted to do this and how big of a dream it was for him, he didn't listen to his father and he went ahead and enrolled. So in the late 60s, David was stationed in naval base in Portsmouth on his first ship, HMS Eagle. He did change a little bit when he was in the Navy. Um, he is said by a lot of his, his Navy mates, people that he served with, he was a very arrogant young man. He was very argumentative. He had to have the last word. He was a bit of a know-it-all. Um, and in his time in the Navy, David had got into quite a bit of trouble for We'll say normal hijinks for drunkenness, for pranks, for just a lot of stuff that he shouldn't have been doing, but a lot of people would possibly excuse because he was in his late teens at the time, so it was normal kind of, I suppose, teenage hijinks. But that kind of behaviour, the sort of fighting and drinking and pranks, would actually give way to one incident which stands out in David's past. He was stationed in RMAS Brody in Pembrokeshire, and um, he was meant to be on watch that evening. He appeared for his position as watch and he'd had a bit too much to drink. He was drunk. Now earlier in that evening, he had actually seen his name written down in an officer's handbook. He took this to mean that he was going to be either in trouble or they were maybe going to give him a change of job, which he didn't want as he very much enjoyed what he was doing at that time. So David actually took it upon himself to break into an officer's mess wardroom 
and he set fire to a lot of papers in a bin. And the fire did get out of control and David would go and seek help. He would put forward that he was just a witness like anyone else. Then when questions were asked, he did actually admit that he had started the fire, but he claimed it was accidental. He had started it by putting a cigarette in the rubbish bin. But the officers must have cottoned on to David and his normal kind of behaviour as they saw straight through his, his excuse and he was actually court-martialed for this. He got into a lot of trouble. David was given a 90-day punishment for this negligence and he did actually have psychiatric evaluation. Now, that evaluation, the report has never been made public either to his parents or to anyone really, so the results of that evaluation have never really come to light. Now, it wouldn't be long after this incident that he is actually dismissed from the Navy. It isn't actually stated if this court-martial was the reason, but I would imagine that it did contribute significantly towards him being dismissed. But obviously David had a history of bad behaviour, of fighting, of drinking. He went on watch that night and he was drunk. This is arson negligence, so he really wasn't cut out, like his father said, to be in the Navy. So in 1971, a friend of David suggested that he may like to write to his sister, Mary, and David began corresponding with this gentleman's sister. He was 19 years old at the time, and him and Mary became a bit of a thing. Um, they would correspond twice a week, and the letters would be like five, six pages. They would be very romantic. They seemed to be falling in love. And in April, David would go on to meet Mary, um, and they obviously got on famously together, so much so that the following weekend, just one week after they first physically met, David proposed to Mary at a social event in Birmingham and Mary accepted, so David now has a fiancé. Now, it has to be said at this stage that David's mother was not approving of David's engagement to Mary. She didn't want him to marry her because Mary had a back condition um, and this back condition, if it went untreated, could eventually lead to paralysis. She wasn't a very well lady. Now. David's, David's parents in this are not coming off the best, as far as I'm concerned. David's mother felt that Mary was a hypochondriac, that she just wanted attention, that she would be a burden on her son, and she very much pushed her son not to have anything to do with Mary, not to, be, not to marry her. But David, being the headstrong, stubborn individual that he has always been, disregarded his mother's advice and um, had plans of a big white wedding, a big church wedding, a big fancy wedding with Mary. But this is a man that had no job and had no money, who was living with his parents. Um, he'd actually turned up on their doorstep when he was discharged, just looking very forlorn and sorry for himself and said, I'm out. And proceeded to stay there and didn't contribute to any of the bills. He didn't help with the chores. He didn't really seem to be looking for a job. And now he's engaged to a young lady and has aspirations for this massive wedding. Now this isn't something that Mary particularly wanted. She would have been happy with a small registry office ceremony with a few people, but David was determined that he wanted this big white wedding. Now, I don't know if it was anything to do with this or maybe Mary saw something in David that perhaps she wasn't happy about, but Mary actually called off their engagement on New Year's Eve 1971. Um, she cited that um, it was down to her health she didn't know how she was going to be in the future, how her illness would progress, and she shouldn't really have ever accepted David's proposal in the first place. So maybe a case of letting him down gently, I'm not sure, but David finds himself with no job, with no money, and now the one positive in his life, no fiancé. Can I just say I apologise if the lighting in this video is out and in a lot, it's just the sun is coming out and in a lot today. I'm in front of a window, so apologies about that if that's happening. So back to the story. So it's January 1972, David is 20 years old, living at home with his parents. Um, he has tried going from job to job. He's worked as a labourer, he's worked as a chef. He keeps being fired for his attitude, his arrogance, um, his drinking, his moods. Um, he's really not going anywhere fast. And his parents, tired with his lack of contribution and his lack of effort when it comes to jobs, eventually throw him out. So it's at this stage that David turns to a long-term school friend of his called Clive Ralph to ask, can he possibly move in with him for a while? Now Clive um, was actually married to a lady called Elsie. They married when Elsie was only 16 years old. She was pregnant with her first child, Paul, at this stage. 
and they would go on to have a daughter called Dawn and as I say Elsie was pregnant at this time also. They lived in a small house with only two bedrooms on Gillam Street in the Rainbow Hill district of Worcester and Clive says yeah sure mate you can move in and David moves in with the family. Now Elsie says that the area it was a small cul-de-sac with maybe nine or ten other houses um, everyone knew everyone else, doors were very much always left open for people to come in and out and every house in that area had a child that lived within it. So it, it was pretty much a very happy area and the children and the family were all very happy there. So when David moved in he would actually share a bedroom with the oldest son Paul who was actually about three years old at the time and the couple would share their bedroom with the daughter that was already, she was about 20 months old called Dawn and they would go on to have another daughter called Samantha and she would be in her cot in the parents bedroom also. So we have four in one bedroom and Paul and David in the other bedroom. So as I say Samantha was born it was September 1972 at this stage. Clive actually worked as a lorry driver so he would be away quite a bit working and when he was away David would actually help with childcare and everyone says including Elsie the mother that David was fantastic with the kids. The kids loved him, he loved them Neighbours even said he was great with the kids. Neighbours did say of David that he was a bit of a know-it-all, that he had a bit of an arrogant attitude, but when it came to the kids he was great. The only time that changed is when David would have a drink. When David would have too much to drink he potentially had a darker side. So the arrangement seemed to be working pretty much for everyone. Um, David would actually contribute six pounds a week toward the rent and he would occasionally make a Sunday lunch for the family. It, it sounds like he got the good end of the deal there. So um, as I say the only sort of like black cloud was David's drinking and he was well known at the local police station. He had been lifted quite a few times, um, generally walking down the middle of the road on the white line to prove to people that he wasn't drunk, that he could walk in a straight line and invariably he was drunk. He was well known to the police and much to the disdain of his father who lived very close in the local area. His father had always not really had that much faith in his son and I think his son was just proving his father right to, to have the viewpoints that he'd had of him that he wasn't really going to amount to an awful lot and that sort of pretty much does come across when you read the articles. His parents didn't really seem to have that much faith in him um, but really he did nothing to dissuade them from that viewpoint. So on to the night in question. Um, I will give a warning that um, this does involve child murder. It could be extremely upsetting for some people so um, I just wanted to give that warning before I go on. Obviously I'm not going to go into horrible grotesque detail but the, the methods of the child's murder will be mentioned within the video so I just wanted to give you that warning. So it's Friday the 13th, April in 1973 and by this stage Elsie actually has a job working behind a bar in a local area and her husband Clive is going to collect her as normal. Now what he normally did is he would leave, um, he would get there just before last orders, they would have a final pint and then he would bring her home. And when he did this David would usually look after the children um, for that maybe an hour or so that he was away. So Clive goes to actually pick up David who had been out that day drinking with a mate. He'd been at the Bucks Hall pub, he'd been there most of the day, he'd been playing darts, he'd been playing cards and he'd been said to have about five to seven pints but he'd had a disagreement with the friend that he was there with. So the disagreement was actually because David had in his wisdom put out a cigarette in his friend's pint. Disgusting. And the mate wasn't overly happy and David did his usual arrogant know-it-all, hadn't done anything wrong and they proceeded to have an argument. So Clive arrives and collects David who is not in an altogether very good mood and takes him home to look after the kids. Now when I was watching this I will admit my viewpoint was He's collected this guy that's known to be a bit of an arse when he's had a drink and this guy's had five to seven drinks and he's already in a bad mood and you're leaving him to look after your three very young children. But then when I thought more about this, Elsie and Clive were very, very young. I'm looking at this from the position of a much older person. If I imagine having a child at the age of 16, which Elsie was when she had her first, at this stage Elsie would have been I think 19 possibly 20. Very very young. Clive was a little bit older but he was still only in his 20s. 
Um, so perhaps a very naive decision on their part, but not one I feel, you know, I hear a lot of people sort of blame them for this. Um, and it's unfortunate that they trusted this monster with their children. But um, I think we can give them a bit of slack for being a young couple and being a bit naive in this case. Because David had a bit of a temper, but he had never ever done anything at this stage that would make them think that anything even close to this could happen. Um, he was fantastic with the kids. As a matter of fact, David had actually scolded Elsie in the past for being too strict with her eldest, Paul. Um, so they never even for a second imagined something horrible could happen. So sometime between quarter past 10 and quarter past 11 on that evening of the Friday the 13th, David just got enraged at baby Samantha. Baby Samantha was nine months old and she was crying for her bottle, as she did every evening. Now David was used to this, David had heard this many times, David gave her her bottle normally, not a problem, but on this specific evening, David was not in a very good mood. David, on just getting incredibly frustrated at Samantha's crying, um, murdered Samantha, baby Samantha. Um, he actually fractured her skull and that's what she died of. Now, not content with that. Now, people could argue a moment of madness, a moment of just pure unadulterated rage. David actually goes out of the room and proceeds to murder the other two children. He strangles three-year-old Paul with a wire and he slits 20-month-old Dawn's throat. He has murdered all three children in completely different ways, which to me, or for the second two at least, needs to point towards premeditation. The first murder, he could argue, he, you know, he'd have the it's not excusing it by any means, but to me, those second two murders had to be premeditated for them both to have happened in a different manner to the first, but we're not finished. David, not content with having murdered these three beautiful children, went down into the basement and retrieved a pickaxe and proceeded to mutilate all three children's bodies. How long can a man's rage last? At what stage is he going to look down and realise what he's done? Not David. After David has murdered the three children and mutilated their bodies with a pickaxe, he picks them outside, takes them outside, picks them up and impales the three children on a spiked fence outdoors. And not just his spiked fence, the neighbour's spiked fence. David then proceeds to leave the home. So Clive and Elsie arrive home, um, it's only been an hour, and there's police everywhere. Now they're ushered away from the area and they've no idea what's happened and they're told by the police that they need them to come to the station, there's been a murder. Obviously the police are trying to keep them from the area and from that scene as you know no parent is ever going to be able to, you do not want to see that. Um, and Elsie obviously realises something is wrong. Now Elsie has no real memory of that night but she does say that she became hysterical and a doctor on scene had to give her an injection to calm her down and following receiving that injection Elsie remembers very little else of the evening. But later that night, the police had to break it to Elsie and Clive that their three children had been murdered. The police apprehended David McGreedy not that long after at 3.50, just walking down a street in a nearby area. And when asked about the murders, he said, what's this all about? When he was apprehended, he, he just played ignorance. He had no idea, didn't know what they were talking about. But after several hours intense questioning at the police station, he eventually admitted that he did do it. He said, it was me, but it wasn't me. I think trying to insinuate that he'd had a moment of madness or or this wasn't within his character or he didn't know what he was doing, which as I've already said, given that he murdered three children in three separate ways, proceeded to mutilate their body and impale them on railings. Um, that's not a moment of madness. That is thought out, that is callous, that is just, I have no words. He proceeded to explain um, graphically to the police what he'd done. Now, I don't know if there is, all articles have said he proceeded to graphically explain what he had done to the police. I don't know if, you know, that statement exists anywhere to be read. I don't know if what I'm going to read to you is proceeded to graphically explain. I personally myself wouldn't say this was graphic. 
um, I'm just going to read you a statement from David McGrady um, as to what he said to police. Um, so he said, I put my hand, he's talking about Samantha the, the baby, I put my hand over her mouth and it went from there. That's all in the house. On Paul I used a wire. I was going to bury them but I couldn't. I went outside and put them on the fence. All I could hear is kids, kids, kids. His only explanation for the murders ever has been that the baby would not stop crying. So on June 28th, 1973, David pleaded guilty to all three murders. There was, the court case was very quick, it was eight minutes. Um, there was no diminished responsibility, there was no plea bargain, so it went through pretty quickly. He went on to have numerous, very short, like 10 minutes at a time, court visits where the courtrooms would be packed with the public um, wanting to see this monster who'd done this. And it was packed mainly with women which for this time apparently was very unusual. They just wanted to have a look at this murderer. Um, there was women stood outside with prams, with children. They were just... I think if those mothers had have been able to get their hands on David McGreevy, he would have never had to worry about serving time in prison. He was eventually sentenced to a minimum of 20 years in prison. And he went on to be the victim of frequent abuse in prison. Um, now, I don't think I need to tell people in the prison system that child murderers or paedophiles or people that do things to children are the lowest of the low, are subject to a certain hierarchy of treatment by other prisoners. Um, he, I would assume that he was physically assaulted. He was urinated on and they did spread excrement over the walls of his cell. A lot of people have said that no one deserves that, um, regardless of what they've done. And I do know that most true crime YouTubers don't really like to say how they feel for fear of backlash because everyone out there has different opinions. I know a lot of people's views on rehabilitation and fair treatment. I don't think the guy got as bad as he deserved. That's my viewpoint. I'm going to quote Stephanie Harlow. Don't come for me. That's how I feel. What this guy did was abhorrent and prison's too good for him. That's that's where I'm coming from with this. So due to what David McCready had done, he became known as the Monster of Worcester and he was subject to substantial press coverage. At the time there wasn't that much coverage but later people did get to know him um, and he created a lot of press interest around himself which I will get on to. In 2006 he was actually transferred to an open prison in Liverpool now, Elsie, the mother, was not actually made aware of this, which to me is just ridiculous. An open prison means that you can go out and about during the day, you can have a job, as long as you're in the prison at night time. But also, I did read that he was able to stay at a bail hostel in Liverpool also, so I don't know if that was after the initial time at the open prison or whether he alternated, but he was out on the streets during the daytime and um, Elsie was not made aware of this. But the Sun newspaper found out and published his photograph, um, which, here we go, um, walking up and down the street and due to this and due to the seen significant threat to his life, he had to actually be transferred back into the normal closed prison system. Now I don't feel too sorry for Mr McGreevy. Mr McGreevy had read the Human Rights Act of 1998 and he had appealed under five different clauses why he should be granted an anonymity order. I can't say that word. Anonymity. Anom anonymity. Oh Jesus, you know what I mean. He wanted to be anonymous. Similar to um, the murders of Jamie Bulger, um, Maxine Carr, um, Certain criminals are entitled to anonymity, I can't say it, orders where they can remain anonymous and David McCready felt that he deserved this um, as part of his human rights, as part of his right to safety, privacy, all these things. Um, I'm just wondering at what stage he considered the human rights of those three children, babies. So in 2009 this order was actually granted by the High Court of Justice during one of the parole hearings of David McCready. So this order was actually contested by the British press, the Press Association and the Secretary of State for Justice. They argued that setting such a precedent would prevent the coverage of dangerous criminals. This order was actually lifted on the 21st of May 2013, so that's still four years. 
This was lifted by Lord Justice Pitchford of the Court of Appeal and Mr Justice Simon of the High Court of Justice. This was based on the public interest of the release of a dangerous criminal and the perceived lack of danger to McCready himself. So in December 2018, a report is released on David McCready saying that he has changed significantly in his 45 years incarceration and he was actually legally cleared for parole at that stage. It said that he took on full responsibility for what had happened and that he had developed self-control as well as a significant understanding of his problems and what had happened in his life to cause those problems. A psychologist identified reasons why McCravey would be less likely to offend in future, including a supposed ability to now have some self-control and the fact that he says that he can now remain calm under stressful situations. He was also shown to be compliant and cooperative with authority, which suggests that he would comply with his license conditions when he was released. It was also said that a network of friends and family in the area would also prove as a significant protective factor. I'm just wondering who wants to be friends with David McCreevy, but there we are. Elsie was actually only informed of David McCready's release on the morning of his release by victim support. Now, David is under very strict curfew. He is not allowed in the Worcester area or anywhere near where Elsie actually resides. So folks, David McCready is out there right now, walking up and down the streets. Um, his picture has been published. Um, a big backlash was released because his pictures were released. They said it wasn't fair, it was against his human rights. He should be entitled to live his life, you know, free of any sort of persecution, etc, etc. Let's not forget this man murdered three babies, three children in horrible, nasty ways. I'm all for rehabilitation of prisoners. Um, I do feel that a lot of pretty nasty people out there can be rehabilitated. But when it comes down to someone that has murdered three children, that has had no reason to do so, that has snapped, that has been known for impulsive behaviour in the past that's completely out of character, that has been said by pretty much everyone he knows to be a pretty unlikable character, um, to have drink issues which made him very, very violent, dark. I don't see how any psychologist could say that he poses no risk. If these behaviours in the past have come out of nowhere, Obviously David McCready has proved that for many years he can live doing absolutely nothing and then impulsively he can murder three children. So, and three children that he, by all accounts, loved. Because he had an argument with his friend in the pub. And that little girl cried for her bottle every night. And he drunk pretty much every day, so these conditions were not unusual. So you can't even say, oh well, if he stays away from alcohol this won't happen. David McCready has proved a propensity towards impulsive behaviour that's out of character. And even given within a prison situation where everything's rules and regulations that you must follow, who can say that, that David McCready will not have another attack of impulsive behaviour? Um, would you trust your family, your children around this man? If the answer is no, then he should surely not be released because he poses a risk to society. Should he be granted? the right to become anonymous, as see how I avoided saying that word there? No, in my opinion. If you're big and bad enough to carry out the crime, you're big and bad enough to face up to what's going to happen when you're released from prison for committing such crimes. I'm not condoning violence against anyone, but I would be very surprised if there are not a lot of people waiting to see Mr McCravey if he ever comes into their area again. He at least has a chance of life. He has a chance of moving away to another country where no one knows him. But what life did those three little kids have? Those three babies? That little girl, that baby that cried for her bottle and was beaten to death and impaled on a railing. Um, it just sickens and disgusts me to the stomach. And when the Human Rights Act is used for the rights of people that carry out atrocities like this, my viewpoint is, if you disregarded the human rights of someone that you have murdered, why should your human rights be considered? The mother is just beside herself. In her viewpoint, a human life should be worth at least 20 years in prison. I completely agree with her. 
And as she says, he has served 45 years. He killed three people. The minimum he should be in that prison is 60 years. For me, he should never be released from prison because if you never knew why he did what he did, how can you say he won't do it again? So that's my viewpoint. Um, a lot of you will probably disagree with me, but there are certain crimes where rehabilitation is questionable. And to me, this is one of them. So that's the story of the real Friday the 13th murderer, the monster of Worcester, David McCreevy. Let me know below in the comments what you think. Do you think I'm being too harsh? Would you grant him anonymity? Almost. Or do you think he needs to face up to what he did? Let me know below in the comments. I'd love a little like, a subscribe if you would. I'm trying to grow the channel, so I would very much appreciate it. If there's any cases you would like me to cover, let me know below in the comments. I have a few I'm planning at the moment, but um, I'm always up for looking into new cases. So thank you very much for watching. Overnight from Lisa Loves.